So I really come in at this time. When, this is the, the era of the Meyerhoff case that just happened. Yep, so it's the 70s. Dr. Burgess is uh, doing all sorts of novel work of her own with victims of sexual abuse and rape and trauma. Uh, she's doing amazing things that um, had never been done before. She, uh, her work ends up leading to the first rape trauma center in the country. Uh, she writes one of the first studies about rape and sexual assault. Let me interrupt. I just learned something. I had a Harvard student did an honors thesis on the sexual assault nurse examiner program, the history of it over about 40 years. And it had started, or they had started to pay attention to it in 1965. This is a case I didn't know about, but I do know about the person that wrote uh, with Dr. Charles Heyman and the nurse was uh, Nurse Lanza. But what had happened in 1965, a woman was out walking her dogs in the morning, it's like a Saturday morning, was pulled off of the path by uh, several youths and sexually assaulted. Uh, she was taken to um, district, uh, the hospital in DC, DC General, and she said they waited five hours before they were, she was given a 10 minute exam. Even though she had major injuries and so forth, but they decided to do nothing. They said, we can't find them. The one thing that made her different from a lot of other women that were, ha had, were having this experience at the time and still do of, of, of being raped is she was the wife of a Washington diplomat. That made the difference. She went to the newspaper and put, uh, she said, this is outrageous. I had to wait five hours. I, you know, she, she gave her whole story and they covered it. And I'm sure she got her husband involved in it. And uh, Heyman at the time was the um, health commissioner for, for District of, of Columbia. And they did get something going, but they only were able to make it work in DC. He got the, the nurses trained and so forth. And it wasn't able to be picked up and taken to other parts of the country. So it, it, it's not that it failed, but it just didn't get the mileage and the legs that it needed. So that's important to know. And then. Linda and I, Linda Holmstrom and I, come along and do our study, which is now in 72. And because we were able, by this time there were some, we were nurses and, and uh, feminists that were working in the rape crisis centers, and they were the ones that really took the ball and went with it. We were able to get enough information out in a language that, that people were able to use, the rape trauma syndrome, and that was really the, the basis, the foundation for getting it going. Yeah, and I think that's important to the story you just shared too, because it really speaks to the culture of the time where, you know, if you think about it today, a lot of people take some of the progress that's happened for granted, uh, even though there's so much more progress that still needs to be done. Um, but, but your work was really one of the first steps there. And one quote that you told me that always sticks out to me is when, when you were telling physicians and colleagues that you wanted to study this, they said, you're risking your career. And they said, yeah. this is a women's issue why would you want to pay attention to this? And, you know, as if men weren't involved, as if men had nothing to do with it. And that's just, like, it's unbelievable. So important. The doctors were not interested in that they saw rape as an ugly thing. It is an ugly thing, but that doesn't mean you don't get involved in it and then try to help. And so all so, of those factors. And through your study, you started giving people a voice. You gave people a language to talk about what was happening to them. And this work ended up getting picked up by the attention of the FBI, who at the time was starting to get a little bit of pressure to, to, to start teaching their agents about sexual trauma and abuse. It was getting noticed as a major crime within the country. Uh, women's rights movements were coming along the second wave feminist movement and was being vocal about this issue. And so it couldn't be swept under the rug anymore. And your work uh, w was really the, the final push, this big push that it needed to get uh, brought to national attention. And so Roy Hazelwood learned about your work. Yeah. Roy Hazelwood, he deserves yeah, a Roy clap. Roy a clap, you bet. He noticed your work. He was directed at the time to, uh, as part of the FBI's teaching academy, to talk to other agents about this, this epidemic that was going on. He knew nothing more than any of the other agents knew, so he found out about your work. He called you. He asked you to come down and speak at the academy, and at first you were a little, a little hesitant. I was. I really was. I'd been talking with nurses and, and crisis workers, women, feminists, and so forth, and all of a sudden I get this call from the, the FBI, and it's very official. I know that they take lessons on how to make phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> 
But anyway, I said, I thought to myself, why should I do this? And then I thought, well, why shouldn't I? So I said to him, I think I will come down and find out what you're teaching them. And I did. 